Happy Friday. So I brought my Neuro Coffee on the road and it is perfect as usual, even in the purple room. So I'm in the purple room today. I had a mentorship call this morning that went really, really well, but we talked about restrictions in the upper dorsal rostral area and how it affects the lower cervical spine. So I thought talking about that today would be of interest. Came into the purple room, so I have a couple of models that we can use to give you a frame of reference and then maybe we'll sneak out into the gym a little bit and, and show you a couple of ways that we can strategize to restore expansion to the upper dorsal rostral area and recapture some of that lower cervical range of motion as well. So the area that we're talking about is this lower cervical area. So this would be my cranium. My upper cervical spine is here, lower cervical spine. And these would be the upper two ribs. So we're looking at T1, T2 where these ribs attach. But the area that we're talking about is this lower cervical area. Under normal circumstances, when this lower cervical area turns, the upper cervical spine would turn in opposition. So as we walk, our head is relatively stable, but this lower area is going to turn from side to side as we walk. So we get the counter rotation up here at the at the cervical spine. However, if we get this upper dorsal rostral compressive strategy, so we're going to see concentric orientation in the posterior scaling, we'll see it in the levator scapula, we'll see it in the upper trapezius, we're not going to see this normal counter rotation mechanism occurring. And so we want to make sure that we can restore this. So what we have to do is we have to capture eccentric orientations again in all of this posterior musculature. There's some easy ways to do it and there's also some tells to let you you know that you do have this compressive strategy going on. So let's go over those tells first. So as we look at Alfred here on the table, one of the things that we can actually look at from a structural standpoint is this, this angle between the spine of the scapula and the clavicle. And we refer to that affectionately as the Camperini angle named after the late great Mike Camperini. And one of the things that we want to look at is we want to make sure that that angle is about 60 degrees. That would be a normal representation. More often than not, though, when we have this upper dorsal rostral compression, this angle is actually going to be less than 60 degrees. So right away, we have a visual representation of this compression. And what's happening here basically is we have the narrowing of the angle. And so the scapula actually just rides up this posterior rib cage as the upper trapezius will pick up its concentric orientation. Now it can certainly try to assess the lower cervical spine manually to determine whether it can turn or not, but actually a better test is looking at, at end range shoulder flexion. So as I flex the shoulder, what I should see is a posterior tilt of the scapula is that upper dorsal rostral expands. But what I should also see is that ipsilateral or same side lower cervical rotation. So if my shoulder flexion is limited, I kind of know that I've got this upper dorsal rostral compression strategy in play. If you've got some manual therapy skills, I've got a couple videos on YouTube that will show you how you can manually restore the expansion of this Camperini angle by depressing the scapula and rotating the cervical spine. If you don't, then you're going to have to use some exercise related strategies which we can cover out in the gym. Now before we head out into the gym, I want to go through a couple of mechanical issues that we might need to attend to as we go through some of these exercises. So let me give you an example for someone that might be a wide infrasternal angle that would have a representation in the neck of lower cervical extension, upper cervical flexion. So under those circumstances, I'll have a lot of upper cervical rotation available to me with very limited lower cervical rotation. So for me to actually create the expansive strategy in the upper dorsal rostral area, I'm gonna to have to drive expansion from the top down. So what I'll have to do is I'll have to use a neck position during the exercise that will actually max out my upper cervical rotation so I can drive the remainder of the lower cervical spine into a turn that will promote expansion in that upper dorsal rostral area. If I was to keep my head straight ahead, chances of me creating the eccentric orientation in the musculature that is causing the compressive strategy in the first place is unlikely. So again, I'm gonna to have to turn my head all the way into this expansive strategy in the upper cervical spine that eccentrically orients upper trapezius, eccentrically orients an element of the levator scapula and the posterior scaling. 
So out in the gym, I'll frequently use chopping motions to help restore this upper dorsal rostral expansion. Many times, if we do any sort of overhead reaching under these circumstances, they can either be provocative if I'm dealing with a painful situation, or they'll promote a compensatory strategy where I actually turn the cervical spine in the wrong direction. By using a chopping motion, as I chop down and across the body, I can actually reorient the entire spine in the direction that I'm trying to promote expansion. I also need to remember to orient the head and the neck in the appropriate direction to promote the upper dorsal rostral expansion. Once I reacquire the upper dorsal rostral expansion, which is indicated by my restoration of my end range shoulder flexion, I can start to restore normal cervical mechanics to my activities. Under these circumstances, a high to low cable press fits the bill. I'm still going to promote the posterior weight shift, the posterior expansion during this exercise as I reach forward, but under these circumstances, I'm going to utilize normal cervical mechanics of lower cervical rotation in one direction, upper cervical rotation in the opposing direction. Now under these circumstances, I get normal eccentric orientation of all of the musculature that would be causing the dorsal rostral compression in the first place. So once I can consistently capture this dorsal rostral expansion as indicated by my shoulder flexion measure, I want to learn how to maintain expansion under load. So this is where I may want to use activities such as unilateral carries, especially a kettlebell carry in a rack position which places that dorsal rostral area in an expanded position as I'm moving dynamically under load. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of understanding about this upper dorsal rostral area and the lower cervical area. I would suggest that you go to my YouTube channel and check out some of the manual techniques that are addressing this area, as well as some of the other activities that influence dorsal rostral expansion. So everybody have a great day. Um, hope you had a productive week. Have a great weekend. I'll see you next week.